I find that starting seems to be one of the <clears throat> most difficult obstacles to overcome when chasing a dream or going after a goal to be set in our lives. And when I was working on this presentation, I was trying to figure out how I wanted to start. And that seems to be my biggest concern anytime I talk is how do I begin? So I figured the best way to start would be with gratitude, just like I start every day. So I wanted to say thank you for everyone coming out, your time and support. Thanks Dr. Westman and the Adapt Your Life uh, team for having me at my second event. And uh, also thanks to all the other amazing speakers that were uh, sharing their stories today. It's, it's, it's like it's such an honor to be able to share my story with everyone and to be a part of this stage. So uh, thank you. Now, my favorite thing in life is our purpose or our why. And there's a guy named Simon Sinek that has a great book and a great TED talk that I discovered in uh, 2013. And my why is real simple. You know, I want to inspire change and perspective that leads others to take new action in their lives because I want them to become empowered to become as healthy, happy, and successful in their lives as I've been able to do. And ultimately, I don't want people to suffer. You know, like I was suffering for a while and it took hitting my head to figure out what that problem was that was leading me to suffer. And I will say too, my, tr my why is transformed. It started off on what I call self. I want to become a professional BMX athlete, and I did that. And a lot of the events that I'll be sharing that took place put me on purpose. So my why started on self, and now it's on purpose. And I've devoted my life to sharing the information that's helped me so that way I can help others, because I don't want people to suffer. Now, how many of you actually prioritize the health of your brain on a daily basis? Everything you do, eat, say, think, how many of you, by a show of hands, actually prioritize your brain every day? Awesome. <laughs> we got one. <laughs> so how do you think that would affect your overall health? Like we know the brain is our conductor. It's our operating system. It controls everything. How do you think that your overall health or every other aspect of your life would improve if you prioritize the health of your brain? I want you to think about that for a second. Because I'm here to share how lack of prioritizing my brain's health almost killed me and ultimately led me to doing what I'm doing today and how I'm in front of you right now. So I want to take you back to almost a year after brain surgery. It was March 2011 and I'm flying around Iraq for 12 days doing demos for our US troops with some friends, some BMX riders and some skateboarders. And I almost didn't take the opportunity to go on that trip because of fear. I mean, I'm going to a war zone. And the, the girl I was dating at the time was begging me, don't go. And I was like, I'm never going to be able to go to Iraq again and like, to ride my bike. Yeah, I'm going to go. And the photo in the middle is me sitting on like, the net bench, if you will, on a C-130. Anyone ever fly in the C-130? All right, cool. We got a couple people. So you know. So unlike a commercial Delta flight where the pilot comes on about 25, 30 minutes and he goes, all right, folks, so uh, about 25, 30 minutes away, why don't you bring your seats upright, put your things away, stow your tables, because we're going to land soon. And it's a gradual landing. Well, on a C-130, not only do you have all the air flowing through, you can smell the fumes, the pilot comes on, all right, get ready, we're going to land, and just <laughs> right down. Your stomach drops, it's insane. But the reason I'm sharing the story of Iraq is because that photo in the middle, I took that phone, uh, photo, I'm, with my phone, like a selfie. And that was the first time I ever wrote anything about my journey. I intended it to be uh, an article in the magazine that's no longer around, but called Ride BMX. And it happened to be uh, my first blog four years later, ironically. It took me four years to post it. <laughs> so that, that talk about starting, it took me four years. But it was just a great moment because I was reflecting almost a year out of brain surgery where the doctor told me I'd never ride my bike again and I would die either way. I'd have it, you know, the potential to die. And I'm in Iraq flying around, performing, doing the thing I love most for the troops. And I just think that's such a profound thing because had I not taken that opportunity, I wouldn't have been able to share my story with the troops and get them motivated because you know, they're, not, they're not seeing anything but war. Now taking it back to the beginning, I'm you know, born and raised Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And I grew up with an amazing family, loving and supportive. And that's ultimately where I found my passion for BMX. Like most kids, I got into baseball at a young age. I was playing t-ball and then got into Little League and then basketball. But my birthday is November. My 13th uh, Christmas, I got a BMX bike, that one right there. And my dad surprised me one day. And I originally, my plan was to go to college to play basketball so I could go to the NBA. But I also was into dirt bikes. My family couldn't afford one, so I got the next best thing, and that was a BMX bike. And it slowly consumed my life. I stopped playing school sports. I was also going into high school for a technical high school to be trained for landscaping, and I was working for a friend of the family. And I was making really good money, and I was being you know, taught how to you know, live the almighty American dream, have my own business one day, support a family, make good money. And you know, it, it was awesome, and I really enjoyed it, but I got an ultimatum from my boss one day. 
All the money I was making, I was flying around. I was now competing professionally at 17 years old, and I was just living the dream. But I was taking a lot of Mondays and Fridays off. And I remember he was like, hey, Josh, like, you're one of my main guys. At this time, I'm running my own routes with a truck and trailer and doing, doing my thing. He's like, you're taking a lot of days off. I need you here. Well, you got to pick. And I knew it was a no-brainer. I was like, all right, later. <laughs> I'm going to BMX. And I knew at 17 that I'd be able to go to school or get a job in my 30s or 40s. Ironically, just turned 30. But at the time, I was like, man, I got this shot. It's a once-in-a-lifetime shot. I'm 17. My parents are supportive. They're allowing me to make this choice. I need to take it because I need to be where the best are, training in the best ramps, to have a shot at living my dream to the fullest. And my parents, I can't thank them enough. They actually signed me out of school. They allowed me to drop out at 17 years old. And I moved 13 hours south to Greenville, North Carolina to train with my idol Dave Mira and the other professionals and had a lot of great success. Now, like I said, along that journey, had a lot of great success. <laughs> 2001 is a chubby 14-year-old me meeting Dave Mira for the first time. And I was just in heaven, like cloud nine. 15 years later, it was the last photo I ever received or I had taken with him. Four days later, he actually passed away. But that, I, my hero became my friend. All the work I put in, it manifested further than I ever expected. And it was, like I said, I had a lot of success. And a lot of success meant a lot of freedom. I'm living on my own now. I'm 17, making money, doing what I love, traveling, hanging out with my idols. And it was a freedom to do what I want when I wanted, to go to bed when I wanted or lack thereof, to eat what I want, drink what I want, just chasing girls, just partying. I'm living in uh, East Carolina University town, but not going to school. I'm living the afterlife and then getting up in the morning and training all day. This is a photo of my 21st birthday, November 2019, or 2009. And the guy on the left is a guy I looked up to in the BMX world, and I still do. And the objective that night was to not let one of those Long Island iced teas go empty until I couldn't hang on to him. Typical 21-year-old, and you know, as you can tell, I'm not really quite there. <laughs> and the girl in the middle is actually his now wife. <laughs> but throughout the course of 2009, although I was having a lot of success, you know, I'm on TV, I'm on X Games now, I'm friends with my hero, I was having a lot of pain, I was suffering, and I just pushed it off. A lot of debilitating headaches and migraines that would eventually lead me to throwing up, my vision would go, and I had to have friends drive me to the emergency room and urgent care multiple times. And every time I said, hey, Shouldn't we get a scan? There's something wrong with my brain. Shouldn't we look at it? No, you're fine. You're 20 at the time, 21. You just have headaches. You know, you're in shape though. You're, you're healthy. You just have headaches. It's normal. Here are some pain pills. Go take them. If you, don't, if you need more, come back. The funny thing with that, not really funny, but I had a, a traumatic experience when I was younger that I associated taking the aspirin that led me to vomiting, so I never took them. But the last time I went in, it was so bad. I said, screw it. Let me take them. Thankfully, I wasn't driving because on the way home, projectile vomited like I was afraid of in the passenger side of the car. Had to pull over and the vomiting was so bad that it just turned into this dark red blood. And now I'm surrounded on my hands and knees on the side of the road with my own blood, thinking the doctor just told me I'm healthy and there's nothing wrong with me, yet I'm, it looks like I'm dying. And it was hit or miss, the days where the pain were you know, bad or you know, the vision was bad on and off. And you know, so I just pushed through it, back on my bike and a couple weeks later, and although he said I was you know, healthy and normal and the pain was here, here or there, I just kept pushing through. And one day I was trying a new trick for the first time out of the foam pit on the real ramp. See, now we have the foam pit, practice a trick. We have a padded ramp. You safely practice it. If you fall, it's you know, more forgiving. And then the real ramp. Back then we didn't. So I just did it a bunch of the foam, felt good, went and tried it. Ironically, was fearful of over-rotating or under-rotating, so I over-rotated, got sent to my side, whiplash hit my head, got knocked out. Now, the pain wouldn't go away for three days. Sometimes it'd go away, sometimes it would, you know, it'd just hit or miss, but this time it just, three days straight. So I went to the emergency room, or urgent care, I should say, and got an MRI, because now it was deemed necessary that I hit my head, all right, you need an MRI. And they accidentally diagnosed me with a brain tumor. So all that time, a year and a half of suffering, telling me, no, you're fine, here's some pain pills. I didn't have a pain pill deficiency. I had something internally wrong. And that fall, my, my surgeon, Dr. Alan Friedman Duke, he told me, you're lucky you fell and hit your head because if you didn't hit your head, you'd be dead. Because the size of that thing and the pain I was going through, he was like, you had another month or two. So literally, BMX saved my life because I had, not, had I not tried that trick, I wouldn't have hit my head and I wouldn't be here today. Now, the recovery process is phenomenal. I thought best case scenario, if I'm riding my bike again, it's gonna be like a year. It only takes four weeks for the skull to fuse back together. So on week four, I got the MRI. 
despite having four titanium screws in my, my skull now, everything was fine. Took another week off just to make sure it was good. Week five, I'm back on my bike. And that photo right there is, I want to say October 2010, so not even like six months after my brain surgery in Vegas, made my first Dew Tour final. One of the biggest contests we had finally made a final. Finally made a final. Uh, but it was just it's such a profound experience. 75 staples, 16 stitches later, and I'm back on my bike now, despite the doctor telling me that I'd be dead, you know, and I probably would never ride my bike again. Now moving forward, towards the end of 2010, a friend sent me a documentary on Netflix. Um, I'm not going to mention it because I have to actually go back and keep saying this, but I haven't seen it in a couple of years, so I don't know if I agree with it. But the way they put the information of our lifestyle choices, mainly nutrition and exercise and mindset, um, the correlation to our health, and it just it clicked for me. I was in a very fearful state. I was thinking, oh man, I don't want this brain tumor to come back, and maybe I caused it. And so it led me to making a lot of changes and learning about holistic health and nutrition and Making a lot of changes, not, not as many as I reflecting on now uh, needed to make, but there was a lot, of, a lot of changes that were made. I had a lot of success, started feeling better, you know. And then 2012, September, a routine MRI showed two new masses had grown back. Dr. Friedman explained it was due to the complications of the original tumor wrapping itself around main artery and my optic nerve. And so he, he couldn't risk hitting you know, either of them because I could have a stroke, become paralyzed, bleed out, or die, along with two other pages of risks I had to sign off on. So he suggested radiation. My mom battled colon cancer for a while. She's alive and well today, but she did it with a smile every step of the way and actually hid it from me for the first year, which only a mom can do because she wanted me to succeed. But radiation was scary to me. I was very ignorant to it as well, but I just knew it just, it just didn't sound well. So I took to Google found gamma knife radio surgery, despite its name, as non-invasive outpatient procedure. And that actually led the two tumors that grew back to shrink for four years. And as of 2016, they've been stable. I actually had an MRI the day before I flew here for the two-year follow-up, so we'll, I'll uh, have to update you guys later. But the photo on the right, they got rid of that model three months later. So thankfully, I get to experience what it feels like to be awake and have four screws drilled into your skull. They numb the area, of course, but you're still awake. You're seeing things, you're hearing things, your brain, your head is just shaking. On the fourth screw, I almost threw up my lap. I was just, couldn't handle it, but thankfully they were done. But I've been able to, this, this, this journey up into here and then leading forward, I've become really passionate about medical imaging and Gamma Knife because I've referred a lot of people to check out Gamma Knife and it's helped them, especially with inoperable brain tumors. It's done a lot of things and I had to search really hard to find it and thankfully I had a friend that was super supportive. But the, like, the MRI, which had I got one a year and a half sooner, possibly would have led me to having Gamma Knife without the invasive surgery. So I just love sharing those two things. Okay, so November 2012, I had Gamma Knife doing well. I was actually riding six days later, which was phenomenal. Um, no side effects, which is one of the reasons why I used Gamma Knife and decided to go through with it. But uh, it was 2013, a friend of mine gave me Dr. David Perlmutter's book, Grain Brain. And anyone, anyone read that? Awesome. That book changed my life. That documentary changed my perspective. That book changed my life because for those who don't know, it's all about high fat, low carb. It was the first time I ever heard about a ketogenic diet. And I was in a fearful state still. Again, it came back twice. And it just, it was, it didn't, it didn't miss a beat. It just made sense. Let's cut out the sugars, the grains, the alcohols. Let's try to be more mindful. Let's try to do some more purposeful exercise rather than just BMX. And let's raise our fats and cut the carbs. Although I wasn't too into keto, it didn't resonate with me enough like, as it does now. I made a lot of changes and I dropped my carbs below 150 every day, whole food sources. Some days I didn't, didn't even eat. You know, I just fasting, it felt good. And the next year I went through a health coaching certification program called the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And there was a couple people, key people in there that advocated again for Dr. Promo's work. Mark Sisson and Dr. Mark Hyman, all about high fat, low carb. And I was like, man, this is just solidifying my belief of this high fat you know, diet and way of eating. And I started making even more changes and just educating myself and then sharing with people. And it was 2015, I had to go in for an ACL surgery and using the principles I was learning from that book, when I came out of surgery from an ACL reconstructive surgery, my knee was hardly swollen where I didn't have to take any pain pills despite what everyone told me about it. And I was back riding three months, three weeks later, competing, I think five months out. And I, got, um, I did really well that year, had an amazing year. 
And that was 2016. I ended up 10th in the overall standings in the world, on the World Series, and was going in 2017 feeling on top of the world. Then February 2017, a routine MRI came, showed that the two tumors that grew back, the gamma knife treated, were still stable. Two additional tumors had popped up on the other side of my brain. And again, it was like that first diagnosis, which I was by myself for it, by the way. And the same emotions came back. You know, why me? What did I do to deserve this? Am I a bad person? But this third time, it was less of that. The second time was uh, a little bit of it, but then the third time it was kind of out the window at this point. I was thinking, how can I use this to help myself? And then how can I share this with other people so that they can you know, become as healthy and happy and successful as possible? And that's when I took to the ketogenic diet even more. And I was like, man, I remember hearing about this keto thing. And they told me, they, they think that the reason why they're popping up and they're benign is because of a thing called neurofibromatosis, which is basically just a fancy way of saying a genetic disorder that can create spinal cord tumors and brain tumors. But thankfully, I just have four brain tumors because if I had spinal cord tumors, probably wouldn't be able to ride a train and be in a lot of pain. And that's something I want to highlight. I just said, thankfully, I have four brain tumors instead of spine, spinal cord tumors. That is a perspective that I think is really profound that anyone can apply to their life. Now, keto. This third diagnosis was like, man, there's something, I gotta do something, I gotta learn more. And I dove in. I, I listened to Dr. Dom's uh, episode on Joe Rogan Podcast multiple times. I, I just started reading more, I got a glucometer to actually test my blood levels of BHB and glucose. You know, I got connected with Dr. Ryan Lowry and Dr. Westman and like all, I just started reaching out. I basically reverse engineered my path to BMX into this health space and this ketogenic space, which everyone is phenomenal. Everyone is super supportive. But after doing so and implementing this diet on point to the best of my knowledge at the time and testing my blood, a year MRI later showed no progression of those two new tumors without meds, without surgery, or without treatment. And I think it's a really profound thing and I'm super grateful for that. Now today, I'm living my life in my own terms. You know, I wasn't gonna let the suggestion of that first doctor telling me you're, you're gonna you know, never ride your bike again, the thing I love most, thing I worked my, you know, my butt off as much as I possibly could and manifested that reality and some. You know, so today I'm living my, living my life in my own terms. I'm currently fighting for brain tumors, but I love BMX and I love sharing. And so ultimately, you know, not every day is easy. People ask, you know, how do you stay so positive? I, I'm not always positive, but the effort is there. That's what's important, is having that alarm system for self-talk and negative thoughts and changing it. And I'm also, you know, like I said, I'm riding at an elite level still. I choose not to compete anymore for various reasons because I want to be more on purpose. Competing wasn't doing anything for anyone. Our sport's small, no one really knew, but g going to places like this, doing you know, more content on the internet, I'm able to reach more people and ultimately fulfill my purpose. And through all this mess, I started a ketogenic health coaching business helping people change their life and have like I've had people tell me thank you you saved my life because the the path I was on I knew I wasn't going anywhere especially with sharing more getting off type 2 diabetes meds uh, my good friend Miles who if anyone was at metabolic health summit or saw my video from there I brought him on stage he reached out to me because he knew I was a doctor but he wanted guidance him and his mom because he was going through three to five seizures a day sometimes seven two years of failed surgeries and all the meds you can think of and he's like hey man I've been I've been seeing what you uh, I've been putting out I've been reading more you know, can you help me? I was like, yeah, of course. As long as you know, I'm not here to you know, treat or cure or anything like that. He's like, yeah, no, no worries. Uh, Metabolic Health Summit was five weeks since he had a seizure. Five weeks after two years of failed surgeries and medications. So I, I don't know, this has been an amazing journey and to be able to create something like that because I'm on purpose, nothing can beat that. The other thing that's super close to my heart is a little boy named Yaka. He just turned 14, Slovenian BMX athlete. His father reached out to me about a year and a half ago on Instagram asking, hey, would you want to coach my son? I love everything you're putting out. You know, you're one of the best in the world and you responded, can you help us? And so now I'm coaching a 14 year old BMX athlete in Slovenia. We're traveling back and forth, we're touring around the world. I got his father, when they came to stay with me in July for a month, I got his father on the ketogenic diet. He dropped 35 pounds just by eating the foods I was eating or I was feeding him. And now their, their family has adopted the lifestyle. And more importantly, Yaka has you know, grown a love for avocados despite what his parents thought. So it's amazing. And of course, you know, I'm speaking. That's a new path, a new, uh, a new fearful path. But like I said, you know, uh, taking that action is the biggest obstacle we'll overcome. So this year, I'm just taking action. I'm speaking more because ultimately, I'm on purpose by doing so. And if I can help you know, change the perspective of one person, they can share it. You know, it's just, it means the world to me. And I'm also working on two different books, um, just more everything aligning with my purpose. 
So one of the, the, the top things that this experience has taught me is perspective is essential to life. And two quotes I love sharing are, number one, life is 10% of what happens to us and 90% of how we respond. Number two, life doesn't happen to us, it happens for us. Both quotes come from different people, but they underline the same choice, and that is a choice and perspective that we have every single day, no matter what. You know, we all face this choice with every, every part of our life. We can choose how we see the world, how we see our lives, and how we see the events that take place, good or bad. And I've, I I've could have given up on more than a handful of occasions, two handfuls of occasions, and I've only shared a few. And one that also comes to mind is Ocean City, Maryland, Dew Tour, 2011. I'm just in practice, you know, 2010 I had brain surgery, now I'm competing again and I'm just on top of the world. I just got a signature product with a bike company I'm riding for, put my name on my dad actually drew my initials and my signature, all that stuff and I'm just so stoked. It's just practice. I have my mouth guard in my pocket, I have my helmet on, I come up short on a ramp, I go seven feet to the left side of my face. My friends said they heard me hit so hard I was snoring instantly, my heart stopped beating for 30 to 45 seconds on the flat bottom of the course. I actually woke up in the ambulance for the first time in my life throwing up. That's how I woke up, was throwing up. And I was in so much pain I didn't even realize my right hand was broken. The first words that came out of my mouth were, I'm done, it's not worth it, I, I can't do this anymore. 14 days later I got cleared to ride, I was back on my bike. <laughs> but to, to sum up perspective being essential, also gratitude, it's the key to abundance. So perspective is the first piece, but no matter what your belief is of religion, of spirituality, quantum physics, energy, whatever, if you're not grateful for the things that you have now from some power that you believe gave it to you, how can you ever expect to get more of that? And that's what this journey has taught me. Number two, which I don't, I don't know how to order these, I just kind of order them, I don't know how to rank them, I think they're all even, but number two, health is internal. It's not just numbers on a scale or on a piece of paper once on the outside. I was a picture perfect example of health until the doctor said, six pack, 20, professional athlete, doing whatever I want. I don't have a weight loss journey that led me to keto, and I think that's really important. There's a lot of people that share that story, which is phenomenal, and a lot of people struggle with that, but I don't think the conversation of internal health is talked about enough. Miles is a great example. 6'4", he's a giant, in shape. He was having seizures. Change his diet, they're gone, for the most part. You know, With me, I had to learn this the hard way, and I'm thankful because it's taught me a lot along the way. My whole life has been you know, a journey but I don't think people have to learn everything that we're talking about the hard way. I think it's a choice. I believe I was able to overcome it and share it ultimately, and that's why I had to go through it. But we can work smarter and not harder. We can be proactive rather than reactive. Had I learned the things I know now, got an MRI when I asked for one, learn about gamma, all these different things, I potentially wouldn't have had the invasive brain surgery. And I just believe that you know, with this information that we're all here to learn and we, if we can share it, then it's our responsibility to make these choices every day to become the healthiest versions of ourselves because it's not just about us, it's about everyone else in our life. Number three, this is my favorite. Anyone, anytime someone gives me an excuse, whether I can relate to that, that experience or not, like your reality is just a manifestation of your choices. Your choices and perspective, thoughts, beliefs, self-talk, doubt, your actions, the nutrition and exercise or lack thereof, you know, and it, it's all about your choice, how you see the world and how you react after that. And two paths that I love sharing, and I've been in this situation more than, more than 10 times, two handfuls. We have the path of survivorship, and we have the path of what I call victimville. They both take the same amount of energy, and it can be argued that victimville takes more energy because the deeper you get in that hole, the harder it's going to be to get out, rather than making the hard choice now. Maybe it's not going to be you know, as uh, satisfying now, but long term it's going to you know, yield results. It, it's really about that choice and that perspective. Now, why has change so hard? Anyone ever read the 12 week uh, year, the book, 12 week year? No one? Okay, well, maybe you want uh, oh, one, we got one. So you're familiar, the emotional cycle of change. If you haven't read the book, you don't wanna read the book, just Google the emotional cycle of change. It's a U-shaped U curve, it's got five, five points. First point, uninformed optimism. You get an idea, you've got a goal, you've got a dream, and you're stoked, you're like, yeah, I'm gonna do this. Number two, you learn a little bit more. Oh, it's gonna take a while, that's a lot of hard work. I'm gonna to have to sacrifice things. And then you get to number three, where most people fail, and go back to the beginning, is the value of despair. And then whenever you're ready to start again, you go. The people that push forward to number four, or point four, is more information, it's informed optimism. Okay, so I learned the path. I see the journey, I'm gonna set goals, I'm gonna set a plan of tactical action items. We can do this. And then number five is success. But most people get stuck in the middle and usually it's fear, fear of failure, fear of judgment. 
And something um, was Dr. Lisa mentioned, Joe Dispenza, and that he's changed my life. Three years ago, I went through a workshop of his phenomenal TED Talk and book. But something I've learned is called the TEAR method. It's an acronym. Thoughts, emotions, actions, and results, or I like to say reality. Typically, we start with emotion. And we typically start with a negative emotion, because why do you want to change if you're feeling good? Whether it's stress or fear, anxiety, doubt, disbelief, trace it back to your thoughts. What are you thinking about that's creating that emotional response? Because if you can change that thought, you'll have a different emotional response. It'll lead you to take a new action. You'll manifest a new reality in your life. And it's easier said than done, but I'm proof that if you put that into action and you practice that and you don't give up, then you can you know, have a lot of amazing events take place in your life. But it's really about that perspective and the longevity piece. Now, before I end, I want to ask you four questions that can be very simple but very complex at the same time. I mean, you know, I'm not looking for answers. But think about them, write them down, take a photo of this. But number one, what do you want in your life? A lot of people are afraid to say what they want. They're afraid to ask for things in their life. I was one of them. I grew up in a, a, a family that you know, was, money was stressful, you, you know, it was hard, it was paycheck to paycheck. If you wanted to make good money, you had to be famous or do something stupid like sell drugs or rob someone. So think about it, what do you want in your life? And forget about the subconscious programming that's led you to where you are now, but think about what you really want. Number two, what do you need in your life? We know we need air, we need food, we need water, we need shelter, clothing, and money to pay for all of them. But what do you need in your life to feel fulfilled, feel happy, feel like you're on purpose, like you're doing something? What do you need? And maybe it's yoga, and maybe it's reading a book, maybe it's taking a work day off to go play with your kids or do something out of the ordinary. But what do you need? And number three, what's holding you back? It's usually fear. That's what it was for me of various different things. And then number four, what are you willing to do about it? What are you willing to do for the things that you have the audacity to say that you want and need in your life? You know, like I said to start this, it's usually taking action is the biggest obstacle to overcome. So what are you willing to do about the change that you want to see in your life? And then remember, use that, that tear method to tear those limiting beliefs down. Now, this is a, a hard thing for me to talk about, but Dave Mira and my brother Danny, they're the fuel to everything I do. Sorry. <laughs> Dave passed away four days after that photo. He was diagnosed with CTE. It was a self-inflicted gunshot wound. That was February 2016. Just this past June 2018, my brother did the same thing. Now, the two of them, like I said, are the driving force to everything I do because had I been able to have the time to implement the ketogenic diet with them, it could have at least given them a chance to still be here today. Maybe not, but maybe. We're all still here. Why I do what I do and have not given up on any of these events when I wanted to, when I went through depression, when I was stuck in my bed for a week after my brother passed, thankfully Jakin, his father, came to stay with me a week after and got me out of bed. If we can share this with just one person and they can share it, it's a ripple effect. And it could change so many lives. It's changed my life. At the end of the day, it's just food. Despite what Miles' doctor said, it's nothing radical. Getting your head cut open is radical. Dying is radical. Watching someone that you love suffer is radical. It's just a choice. It's been shown to help people with cancer, people like myself with TBIs, depression, anxiety, epilepsy, and the list goes on. So why aren't we sharing this more? I mean, I, I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but why are we not sharing this more? Because I want you all to join me becoming the change that we want to see in the world and remember that fears is a thought and thoughts can be changed. Thank you.